time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about time, episode three. I told you, this episode, we got a heavy hitter. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, today's guest, uh, none other than Dr. Ruth Simmons. Ladies and gentlemen, she's done it all. She's been everywhere, she's seen it all. She's seen some of the greats. She is one of the greats. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe I'm here with her. The energy she has brought to PV, nothing like it. Students are in invigorated. St the excitement factor students get from just saying her name or hearing her name or seeing her on campus is mind blowing. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one. And today I am sitting with that one. After this commercial break, I got a very special interview with the first female president of Prairie View A&M University, the eighth president at that, Dr. Ruth Simmons. Dr. Simmons, how you doing today? I'm good. That's good, that's good. So, you retired in 2012 from Brown University. I did. After 12 years? 11. 11. You were, you were done for about five years. <laughs> yes. and, you, and you became the interim president right. for PV in 2017. What made you want to do that? Frankly, the students. I uh, I grew up in this area. I was um, grew up in Fifth Ward, and went to Phyllis Wheatley High School, okay. uh, which is better than Jack Yates. Um, and then <laughs> I have to always get that in. Um, and then, uh, really, something wonderful happened for me, mm -hmm. coming from that neighborhood. Teachers caring about me, giving me a way to go to college. And I just, you know, when I was back here on the Prairie View campus when I first started, it was kind of overwhelming to me, the fact that there are students at Prairie View today on the same path that I was on, you know, as a 17-year-old. Yes, and it just seemed um, almost as if I was compelled to try to do whatever I can mm -hmm. to help. Uh, and so here I am. So did you think you were just going to stay in that interim, interim role? I did. So what made you say, I want to do it full time? Well, when I, I started, uh, of course, I didn't know the scope of things mm -hmm. when I said yes. Um, but once I got to Prairie View and came to understand some of the issues here, uh, particularly uh, issues that students had talked to me about that needed to be resolved. Um, I started trying to implement some change, and I realized something was happening every time I tried to implement change, and that is people were refusing to do it. And I thought, well, this has never happened to me before. I wonder why people are ignoring what I'm saying. And of course, it dawned to me that they decided to wait me out, uh, because I was a short-term person, and therefore, since I'd be gone in a few months, um, if I said, you need to do this, why should they bother? And so that's what convinced me that if I really wanted to do anything substantial, I'd have to commit for longer than interim. Wow. So, for Prairie View being the first female president, that's not your first first. No. You were the first African-American president at an Ivy League school. What was that experience like? Well, it was, um, you know, uh, to be honest, I always think about the work that I have to do. Mm -hmm. 
the geography and all of the trappings, it doesn't make much difference to me. And so I was there to do a job, and one of the things that I tried hard not to get sucked into was this th idea of the first black. Because mm. uh, that's really meaningless. What does that give you? It gives you nothing. Because the ultimate uh, question people will have is, what did you do? So I understood that I was not going to get a break because I was a woman or because I was African American. I had to do the job, and I had to do it at a very substantial level, and I, in a sense, had to be better than others in the job. So I focused on the work that had to be done. So the thing that drives you, is it the students? Is it creating a new atmosphere? Is it putting where you are at that time on the map or on a greater, on a greater larger scale? What is the driving force when you take on a new task? It's really all of those things, I would say. I, um, for most of my career, I was a worker bee just trying to do things. Yes, ma'am. And trying to stir up trouble uh, often. Um, but then when I was appointed president of Smith College and my story was told nationally, I got all this mail from young people around the country uh, saying, fundamentally, I'm so pleased to see that you are doing what you're doing because it tells me that I can do it. And I think until that moment, I didn't apprehend the ability that I had to represent something for children. Um, and so when I started in earnest at Brown, I was thinking about a number of different things. I first thought, well, if I'm the first African-American president of an Ivy League university, I don't want to be the last. And that meant that I had to do the job at a credible level in order for somebody to come after me. Yes, uh, and so I was very conscious of the fact that I couldn't fail at that position. At the same time, I wanted it to be somehow meaningful that I was African-American. I didn't want to pretend to be just like any other president who had been there since the colonial era. Um, and so um, I took on projects that would imprint in people's minds that when African Americans come to do a task, they bring all of who they are to do it, and that that's a good thing. So I got embroiled in a very controversial matter, as you may know, uh, to investigate the ties of the university to slavery. Mm -hmm. And um, I did other things related to what minorities experience in the African, uh, in, the, in the Ivy League. Um, and so uh, I wanted to make sure that my people, wherever they are, understood that I was not fleeing my identity as an African American. I was imprinting it on the Ivy League. And so I thought a good deal about that. I also thought about the opportunity to do something to bring knowledge about African American history and culture to the place where I was. So that was so there are all these dynamics going on at the same time that you're trying to manage and at the same time not be a cardboard cutout, a real person with real errors, with real flaws. Um, and with real opportunities to do something constructive. Yes, ma'am. So you're a very accomplished woman, but you are the most humblest woman I've ever seen. There's a grace about you. You are a woman of the people. You don't, you don't shy away from your students. You don't shy away from the issues. So what makes you say, I'm going in and I'm going to stand by my students because you could easily just stay in your office and handle these issues and we not see you, but that's not how you operate. What makes you go to the forefront? Well, I, you know, I, I always advise uh, my students to do what is meaningful to you. Um, what's meaningful to me is to be here for the students who come to Prairie View. The rest of it is wonderful too. But if you ask me what makes the difference for me in staying here every day, um, that's what it is. Because on any given day in any job you have, 
there are disappointments, there are challenges, there are headaches. But what makes you go back every day and feel so exhilarated that you just want to do it forever? And that's the students. Because again, the opportunity we have uh, to make a change because of what we do for our students is, it, it's a precious thing. And I was back at Brown uh, last weekend, and you know, I look out over the campus, and I just remember that in all of my career, from USC to Princeton to Smith to Brown, I could look out over the campus and I would see a few um, faces of minorities. And when I get up here at Prairie View and look out, I see all of the promise of our community. That's tremendous and very moving for, for me. So that's what makes me go on day after day and what allows me to say to people that I don't care. You're angry at what I'm doing, I don't care. Uh, if you think that, um, that I shouldn't do things that are controversial, I don't care. As long as we're moving forward and benefiting Prairie View and moving it forward in a way that will benefit the students to come 20 years from now, yes, I don't care. Uh, and that's the blessing of being so long in my career and at this point in my career because I can do things that frankly when I was 30 years old I wouldn't have had the courage to do. Um, I wouldn't have had the courage to be disliked for my ideas. I wouldn't have had the courage to persist when people were threatening me. Um, uh, that I should slow down. I wouldn't have had the courage. And now at the end of my career, it doesn't matter to me. And so I can do more things, I think, and I hope try to do the right things by listening carefully, uh, by being concerned about the right things and letting the little things go. Um, so these are the things that occupy my, my thinking. Keeping to that, we have a financial aid issue. Yes. <laughs> And it's a big one. Personally, I did mine on time. But when there was a problem, I didn't get the notification until it was almost too late. Then I had to drive three and a half hours from Dallas to come here only to find out that it was only one person working that day, that the rest of them were in a meeting. Why wasn't she there? Why, was, was, why wasn't there anybody here knowing that this is the time that most students have their problems? Exactly. Even then, I still didn't get my award letter until September. I have friends who still don't have theirs. So can you tell us what's being done to counteract those issues? Well, the, the first thing that I heard when I came to Prairie View, in fact, before I came to Prairie View, um, people said to me that that was a huge issue at Prairie View. Uh, and of course, I found it to be true. Um, there are a number of issues involved, uh, some of which I cannot speak about yes, because it would be to violate um, uh, confidentiality. But uh, here's what I will say. Um, financial aid here is immeasurably broken. Um, the customer service, uh, the, the care with which we treat our students um, is um, abysmal at this point. That doesn't mean everybody in financial aid is abysmal. It means that our standard for addressing the needs of our students is not high enough and does not compare with what is typical in a university. And so what we need to do is to bring radical change to financial aid. So uh, you may be aware that recently uh, we have um, made a change in leadership in financial aid. Uh, that was a long time coming um, because uh, financial aid is very heavily regulated by the federal government and by all agencies, including state agencies. And so it's very difficult to um, make change in financial aid because um, uh, you can get sanctioned very quickly for um, not um, doing what is appropriate in financial aid, let me put it that way. Uh, uh, some historically black universities that have gone under have gone under because of financial aid problems. So the processing of financial aid is very, must be very precise. 
because the federal government looks after its money. And if you don't handle the money appropriately, then you can not only be sanctioned, but you can lose your ability to have financial aid from the federal government. So it's a very serious matter. Uh, so in this change of leadership in financial aid, we have a number of things that we have to do. First, um, we have to, we have to um, recruit a leader who has the capacity to do all of the things that we want that person to do. Not just be technically uh, accurate in financial aid, but to care about the mission of Prairie View and to understand that we deliver award letters on time, that we um, talk to students instead of sending them from pillar to post to find out what's going on with their financial aid. Um, someone who leads the operation, who understands that there is a mission here that goes beyond technically filling out forms and making sure the forms are done correctly. Um, and so we have just, that just happened last week. Uh, and so we will be undertaking uh, a search and we will be trying to build up our financial aid, uh, putting more resources into it to make sure that we can get it right. Um, and my, my, I understand that this is going to be a long haul. It's not going to be solved in a month. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but we have to undertake it because if we don't, our students will have a negative experience with Prairie View. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Simmons, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Is my time up already? <laughs> Sadly, it is. I wish we could talk more. Well, maybe we'll have to do this again. Okay. All right. Dr. Simmons, thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, thank you. You're very good. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, I'm gonna give you my closing remarks. It's about time. At Prairie View A&M University, we've been igniting passion in students for more than 140 years. It's about inspiration. It's about global influence. It's about self-expression and individuality. It's about trailblazing a path of excellence. It's about engaging in the greater community. Above all, it's about helping you realize your dreams. Ignite your passion. Experience Prairie View A&M University. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> what episode? This lady sits head and shoulders above the rest. She is everything that you hear when you hear students talk about her. It was amazing to sit next to her. It was amazing to hear her speak. You see that she cares about us. You see she cares about what she does because she easily could have stayed home. She put her time in. She paid her dues. But she came back. And she's out here and she's bringing about change for us. So ladies and gentlemen, just sit back and get ready because the students of Prairie View a and University under the leadership of Dr. Ruth Simmons are coming. We're not holding nothing back. <laughs> so next week, I got another episode for you. And remember, it's about time. Take that unplugged shit a bit.